Okay, good evening, everyone. And uh, we are starting today our uh, webinar, SOE webinar, and I'd like to thank SOE for organizing this and inviting us to put together this session. Um, we are going to be, uh, as you can see here on your screen, a, a very outstanding group of clinicians uh, who have agreed to, to join us for this evening. And, and it feels like, you know, I, I, when I started looking at the choroid, somehow I felt a bit like Captain Kirk, you know, to boldly go where no one has, had been before because the choroid was always that hidden layer and where we, we didn't have access to. We, we know it was there, we knew it was there, but we couldn't really say much about it. But we have been uh, improving our ability. We've been getting more and more useful information. It's guiding us in understanding disease, uh, pathogenesis and understanding outcomes as well. So this is a, a great opportunity to put together a lot of this knowledge. Uh, and uh, so we, we will be having a wonderful time. I, I hope you all enjoy it. We have some housekeeping here that's required. So uh, for you guys, um, you, you can type your questions via the Q&A option that you have in your screen. And we will certainly try our best to answer as many questions as possible. Um, and of course, if, if we can't, uh, you know, we, we certainly try to get back to you somehow in the ones we couldn't get to. Uh, it, as you can see here, if there's a particular question after this webinar, if that being answered, if you want to get an answer, please send an email to the SOE webinars at soevision.org and we'll certainly try to address that. This is being recorded and certainly will become available to you via the SOE Vision website. So with all that done, I'd like to uh, introduce our uh, first uh, uh, speaker is uh, you know, Aniruda Agarwal, who is uh, working now at the Cleveland Clinic in Abu Dhabi. And Ani has a huge experience in, in imaging. He's been working on this since the, his previous uh, time in Chandigarh with Vishali. And will be talking to us about investigating the choroid imaging and how it helps in the diagnosis and monitoring. Thank you, Ani, for joining. Greetings from Abu Dhabi. My name is Aniru Dagarwal, and it's my pleasure to be here with you. And thank you, Team SOE, for this opportunity to present my topic on investigating the choroid, imaging, and how it helps in the diagnosis and monitoring. So at the outset, let me quickly go to my case. Uh, this is a patient who presents with a yellow lesion in the superior retina of the left eye, and one clue to the diagnosis here is that he's an Asian Indian male. And if you do further imaging with fluorescein angiography, you can see that the lesion is hyperfluorescent. And in the late phase, there is some leakage around the lesion. This is what we typically call as the tubercular multifocal choroiditis, as per the latest nomenclature classification by the Collaborative Ocular Tuberculosis Study Group. Multifocal choroiditis lesions with a phenotype similar to idiopathic multifocal choroiditis, which is similar to also the MPE and other phenotypes that do not resemble TBSLC. On the other hand, tubercles are single or multiple small lesions with a central core and a surrounding rim of inflammation. This is another patient here, and you can see the disease is much more dramatic in this eye, and you have a yellow lesion which is surrounded by fluid and on fluorescein angiography, there is nothing much in the initial phase. There is a hypo area. And in the late phase, there is intense leakage with subretinal fluid accumulation. Now, these are the patients who would benefit from choroidal imaging, as we see. Uh, and you can see that this diagnosis is very clear, in, especially if the patient is from uh, endemic country for tuberculosis. And this is another patient who presents with a yellow lesion, which is involving the center. And you can see that there is some uh, fluid, but it's not so much like in the previous case. And the color is also not so intense yellow, it's dull. And you can see that this image, the wide field fluorescein angiography, shows you some leakage in the center and the disc is mildly hyperfluorescent. But if you look at the indocyanin green angiography, the ICG, which gives you the absolutely correct uh, assessment of the choroid, you can see that there is a hypo area in the center, which is not so much evident on fluorescein angiography. The late phase ICG shows you this area much more clearly, and there is hypofluorescence suggestive of a choreocapillaries flow deficit. And this is a patient 
who has some subretinal fluid, but not so much as the previous case. But you can see in the subfovial region, there is a large granuloma sitting right under the fovea. And this is a patient with sarcoidosis. So when we talk about choroidal imaging, one of the most important disease phenotype that benefits from choroidal imaging is choroidal granulomas. And as we see in the examples that I discussed, tuberculosis and sarcoidosis form two most important reasons why you can have choroidal granulomas. A choroidal granuloma due to TB is now called as a tuberculoma, and it usually presents as single, sometimes multiple lesions, which are yellow, which have indistinct borders and surrounding fluid. And you can have rapid necrosis, exudation, and tissue destruction, and those cases are called as tubercular subretinal abscesses. These patients, uh, the highlight of the clinical examination is that they may have significant retinal hemorrhages. Recently, we investigated these patients and looked at multimodal imaging clues to differentiate between tuberculomas and sarcoid choroidal granulomas. And we observed that EDI OCT has a very important role in monitoring the choroidal lesions. We know that on EDI OCT, you can look at the hypofluorescence in the deep choroid. And this is nothing but a full thickness choroidal granuloma with overlying choriocapillaries ischemia or thinning. So this patient, this particular patient that is illustrated on this slide had also a calcified mediastinal lymph node suggestive of sarcoidosis. And so EDI OCT makes it very easy for us to follow up these patients longitudinally. And you can see this patient, um, the panels above A, B, and C are at presentation where you have a large granuloma and Towards the follow-up after treatment, you realize that the granuloma has decreased in the antero-posterior extent first. That means it is responding to treatment and it is improving. So EDI-OCT is very useful and we see that choroidal granulomas heal in the antero-posterior direction first and then laterally. Now in our study, we realized that there are a number of uh, factors on which you can differentiate between TB and sarcoid. Of course, to differentiate between TB and sarcoid, you have to have your labs, your tuberculin skin test, and other evidence of active TB in the body, or even a healed lesion in the body. But we realized that a lot of eyes with TB have intense yellow granulomas, much more compared to those with sarcoidosis. In addition, shape is another important feature to differentiate between TB and sarcoid. A lot of patients of TB will have lobulated granulomas compared to oval granulomas in sarcoid. Many patients of TB also have macular granulomas and they can be perivascular. A perivascular choroidal granuloma is highly characteristic of TB. We also realize that um, dull lesions are sarcoid, intense yellow are TB. And if you have preretinal hemorrhages, again, uh, to reiterate, they are mostly seen in TB. OCT is very useful, and you can see that if there is a presence of outer retinal hyperreflectivity that goes in favor of TB, and I'll just show you on this slide, uh, this is a patient with a large TB choroidal granuloma, and you realize that there is fuzziness of the outer retina with a breach of the RPE, and you can see this in some of the other slides, along with intraretinal, there is subretinal fluid and outer retinal fuzziness. This outer retinal fuzziness or infiltration is highly characteristic of TB, and it can differentiate with from sarcoidosis with a very significant p-value. Also, you see uh, the panel above. This yellow lesion, like I showed you a previous patient, this is another patient who has subretinal fluid, an intense yellow lesion. And this lesion is a single large lesion suggestive of TB. Uh, the patient below shows you multiple hypo areas on ICG. Now you realize here, you don't see so much clinically, but on ICG, the pathology is so much evident. And that's why if you really want to study the choroid, OCT and geography, EDI OCT and ICG are the most important aspects. And you see these multiple choroidal granulomas and this multiplicity goes in favor of sarcoidosis. So if you have multiple small lesions, highly characteristic of sarcoid. EDI OCT again shows you a well-circumscribed oval lesion in the choroid with little amount of subretinal fluid. Uh, 
uh, the exudation is much less compared to TB. And you can see here that the comparison shows you that the vascular vascularization of the choroidal granuloma is much more in TB compared to sarcoidosis. The mean area of granuloma is so different. TB granulomas are large, they're more than 16 millimeters, but sarcoid ones are quite small. Now I'm going to show you another case of a young male with no previous history, spots in front of both eyes. And you can see here on ICG, there is a hypofluorescence suggestive of low deficit. The OCT shows you ellipsoid zone disruption and photoreceptor disruption. It's a large placoid lesion. And of course, there is no doubt in the diagnosis, this is an acute uh, uh, posterior multifocal pigmented uh, lesion, uh, which is involving the fundus here of the right eye. And if you look at the ICG and compare it with OCT and geography, you can see here that there is clear demarcation of the hypofluorescent areas on OCT and geography. There is no signal uh, you know, flow uh, deficit here. You can see there is no shadowing, no artifacts, and you can actually see the area much more clearly on OCT and geography. So this confirms that there is a choriocapillaritis. You have a placoid lesion, which is involving the center. So OCT and geography shows you flow deficits in the MPE, predominantly in the choriocapillaries. On the other hand, you have this lady, which is a 51 year old uh, Caucasian lady with blurriness and spots in front of the eye. On ICG, you have hypo lesions, which are distributed uh, much more prominent in the late phase. And these lesions are mutes, uh, which are characteristically hypo to hypo on ICG, but sometimes they may be iso to hypo. What's interesting is the OCT, because here you have disruption of ellipsoid and it's extending to the outer retina. But you must see here on the OCT that the RPE is completely intact. The choriocapillaries also appear to be intact. And the most interesting aspect is, though you have hypo areas on ICG, you have absolutely no flow deficit areas on OCT in geography. So in MUSE, there is no alteration on the OCTA in choriocapillaries layer. And this is one very interesting finding, and that's why you can actually redefine the disease pathophysiology by using advanced choroidal imaging, like in this patient and in this disease, which is MUDES. Uh, we now assume that MUDES is most likely because of a primary pathology in the photoreceptors. It's probably a photoreceptoritis. And the changes on ICG are pr pr probably because of transient RPE damage causing uh, this kind of a hypofluorescence. If you have a patient of mutes, this is another patient, which is a 38 year old male. Very important findings are, you know, contrasting findings on the blue autofluorescence, the BAF and near infrared autofluorescence. You have hyper on one, which is the blue peak and hypo on the near infrared. And this is so much different. Um, so I, I use these uh, imaging modalities, both of them very much uh, in, in my clinics to, determine if the patient has mutes. This is a non-invasive quick imaging, which tells you uh, that whether uh, you should suspect uh, mutes in your patient, especially if you have the blue peak autofluorescence. But we must remember there's nothing on OCT and geography uh, as compared to ICG. So these patients are very different from your MPE and therefore you uh, must investigate these patients non-invasively and then determine if you'd like to go ahead with an ICG so the learning lesson here is you have intact choriocapillaries in mutes. Now choriocapillaries imaging is difficult because if you have eyes with uveitis, you, you know that your choriocapillaries layer can be quite irregular. It's not uniformly thick. And of course, the other issue is that you have uh, errors because of shadowing. You can have a lesion which is hyper. Even the RPE can cause high, uh, you know, either back shadowing, like on your right side, there could be back shadowing or there could be higher signal transmission, which is why you may not be able to see the choreocapillaries very well. Now, we have been working on building algorithms to determine the area or to quantify the choreocapillaries flow deficit in our patients. Okay. So we have developed sort of a macros. Uh, you can use third-party software, quickly identify the flow deficit areas and measure the area and actually quantify them. And this is very useful
in pre and you know pre treatment and post treatment analysis which can tell you if the patient is improving or not now this is a patient which has a flow deficit area in the choriocapillaries layer and you see that first and the most important step is to subtract the superficial capillary plexus so that you remove all the vessels which are appearing uh, from the superficial capillary plexus you take it out and then you go ahead with your choriocapillaries analysis and once you binarize you have you know an effective area which can be measured and you can use these imaging during the you know at baseline and follow up and you realize that you can actually look at the lesion if it's increasing in size or decreasing so serial assessments is possible using various thresholding algorithms there are standard steps such as standardizing the image removing the projection artifact and binarizing the image and thresholds such as the fansalkar threshold they work really well in analysis of the choroid so there are a number of challenges such as non uniformity of the choriocapillaries layer and projection and irregularity of rpe all of which can be partly addressed some of the newer aspects which are upcoming include image compensation and multiple nfas image averaging which can be very useful in the choroidal or choriocapillaries imaging finally choriocapillary imaging is very useful in patients of vkh and you can see that you have choriocapillaries flow deficit which exactly co-localize with the icg and you can actually use the oct angiography along with icg or even without especially if you are doing a serial follow up and oct angiography may be very useful just to look at the dark dots if they are increasing or decreasing in size and you can taper the therapy accordingly thank you very much thank you soe once again for this opportunity and i'll be happy to take any questions thank you thank you aniruda that, that was a very interesting talk uh, i'm sure there'll be uh, questions at the end uh, regarding some of the points you you raised so i'd like to uh, now move on to our second presentation and uh, uh, professor vishali gupta from chandigarh uh, a real expert in the field of uh, infectious diseases uh will uh, give us a presentation on infective choroiditis so i'd like to thank professor gupta for joining us uh, thank you a very good afternoon to everyone from india i would like to thank soe and especially carlos previsio for giving me this opportunity to speak on infective choroiditis well when we talk of choroiditis it is indeed a very close call between infective or non infectious now here are the three diseases the top one ampi which is idiopathic the middle one to a closest and the down below here is syphilis placoid choroiditis now when we look at these phenotypically it's very difficult to actually say which one of them probably could be infective or non infective especially for the beginner because they all resemble each other so how do we do this uh we first see whether it is choroiditis or retinochoroiditis then we look at if there is associated involvement of the optic nerve head and retinal vessels does it have any other clinical feature that will fit into a known infective or non infective entity is there any anterior segment inflammation with triitis cleritis cnb associated with it the lesion that we are seeing is it unifocal or multifocal unilateral or bilateral does it have any associated systemic features is it recurrent and if so what was the previous episode like and finally is it responding the way it should be responding to the therapy that one has started let's apply this algorithm to some of the very commonly seen situations in day to day practice now i would like to share with you all the example of a 29 year old lady and uh, this is how she presented to us she had received intravitreal triamcinolone oral corticosteroids and even tb treatment 8 months ago and since last 8 months actually she has been on treatment 
when she came to us. Now her visual acuity is counting finger at this point of time. The disease is unilateral. Is it retinochoroiditis or chorioretinitis? Well, it's primarily retinochoroiditis where choroid is involved secondary to it. There is associated vitreitis. Patient is immunocompetent. And as I mentioned previously, it is a unilateral disease. And you can see there is some scar here and the diffuse patches of retinochoroiditis. Important point that I mentioned is sometimes it's very important to look at the past episode. The patient has been on treatment since last eight months, but, but what did the disease look like eight months ago? This is the pictures that the patient was carrying with her that was taken before starting TB treatment or anything. Now, when you look at this clinical picture, this was a clear-cut case of toxoplasma retinochoroiditis, which was confused with choroiditis, and that caused patient very heavily. As you can see, the patient had developed a very diffuse form of choroiditis, like this one, because she was given corticosteroids. So when we saw the patient, we had done the complete workup, including the diagnostic vitrectomy to clear the haze and all which showed the toxocyst. So this shows the important of, importance of recognizing the phenotype so that you don't inadvertently start corticosteroids and cause a lot of visual morbidity to the patient. The second example is the case like this one. Now, this is a phenotype when we look at it, it's peripapillary, pseudopodia-like, which are coming out from the optic disc. There is no vitritis, and if you look carefully on autofluorescence as well, it's the edges of the pseudopodia which are active. Now, this is the kind of the disease when you look at the phenotype, you know it is serpiginous coronitis. Centrifugal spread, exposure of choroidal vessel on healing, and minimal pigmentation. So, when I see a very classic phenotype like this, we do understand this is going to be non infective. Most of the times, though, it is important to rule out some infections like TB. But by and large, the classical variety of serpiginous may be just the autoimmune variety. And you can see here the progression of the FAF over 16 months. Now, what is interesting and the points that I would like to draw attention, there is no multifocality. This one is the autoimmune variety. The multifocality, when you see multiple lesions coming, that actually indicates that the underlying infection might be playing a role. So this is the one which is suggestive of the classic variety of serpiginous choroiditis that, is, that was in this patient autoimmune in nature. On the other hand, there is another example of a patient, a 27-year-old male who complained of decreased vision of sudden onset painless, progressive. Actually, it started with pain and redness in the left eye six days after the onset of decreased vision. So when we look at it, there is choroiditis, which is multifocal. It's not the phenotype which we saw in the previous patient. There is vitreitis and there is peripapillary involvement. Also, it's unilateral and you can see a lot of involvement around the disc but then there are multiple patches of choroiditis which are coming over everywhere. In addition, the patient also has a patch of scleritis on top of that. So now this will becomes an important information because when we look at this phenotype, it's multifocal, vitreitis, inflammation, and scleritis along with it. Now, these things do not fit into the classic non-infectious type of serpiginous choroiditis. So what do we do here? 
the imaging, of course, is just to establish the involvement of the choroid and ICG and to show the multifocality. And the fluorescein shows, like you would expect, multifocal serpiginoid choroidopathy to be. So what do we do here? We do the OCT. The OCT does show there is a response. All the tests for the TB are positive. So this is how the patient is. Uh, these are the tests which were done for TB. PPD scan test was 20 to 20. Quantiferon TB gold was positive. CT chest shows central lobular nodules and mediastinal lymph node, and EBUS was positive for tuberculosis. So you can see the involvement of the outer retina and the choroid like you would expect in TB. And this is following treatment responding to ADT and steroids. So how do you differentiate uh, autoimmune from TB serpiginous like uh, choroiditis? The autoimmune variety tends to be bilateral, whereas TB serpiginous is mostly unilateral. The autoimmune variety would not have any cells in the vitreous or interior segment. So anytime you see a diffuse serpiginous like choroiditis and cells in the vitreous, think of associated infective cause. Autoimmune variety has the lesions beginning in the juxtapapillary area, whereas serpiginous like choroiditis generally begins in the posterior pole. This is not multifocal, serpiginous is multifocal. And in the serpiginous typical variety, you may have pigment clumping at the border, whereas TB generally shows healing in the center. Please remember that all the infective choroiditis multifocal will not be TB. It is just the expression of the disease irrespective of the infective etiology. For example, this young lady, 32-year-old with vitreitis, multifocal lesions, unilaterally, mostly in the posterior pole when you see, you think of the classical uh, example which I have shown you is TB serpiginous like choroiditis. So always investigate for TB. But Please remember that though TB will be very common in the area that are endemic for tuberculosis, we cannot really ignore other infections. So this lady also had history of VCV infection about 16 weeks ago, and her aqueous done was positive for VCV. So though it looked like typical tuberculosis, this was not really tuberculosis, because of the correlation with VCV, she was treated as VCV, and this is how she responded to therapy. But note, the pigmentation here on healing was not as much as we would see in tuberculosis. Another example of a patient who was referred to me long, long time ago in 2007 as the case of serpiginous choroiditis, but actually it was uh, syphilitic with the active serpentine edge, the placoid syphilitic, uh, this thing. So patient was positive, both TPHA and VDRL, and receives treatment for syphilis. And you can see the healing of the lesion here in the bottom panel. So serpiginous like choroiditis, when you see, always think of infection and always investigate to rule out the possible infection. Uh, we have reported mostly on tuberculosis, which is very common with us and coming from the reports from all over the world, TB is a very important cause of serpiginous like choroiditis. But please remember many a times infections other than tuberculosis could actually manifest as serpiginous like choroiditis. Now we come to multifocal variety of choroiditis. So when we discuss the multifocal choroiditis, I will show the example of this lady who is a 57 year old lady, comes to us with painless progressive decreased vision for one month. She did give history of trauma to the opposite eye with stone in 2013. And the left eye was uh, after trauma, lost. It was a thysical eye actually. 
Now, when we first saw her, she had something happening in the peripapillary area. There was fluid. And there were some patches, you know, these yellowish white choroditis patches scattered all over. We did the fluorescein, which showed a very hot disc and something happening, some vascular minimal leak here, and these patches, which were really not typical of anything in the mid periphery of the right eye. Fluorescein showed, which I thought could be a juxtapapillary membrane, but there was, uh, you know, mainly the peripapillary swelling, the choroid was thick. And we kind of in, uh, did the initial investigations, but uh, you know we labeled it as sympathetic ophthalmia because all other investigations were negative. So she was treated on systemic corticosteroids and as a thyroid plane to which she initially did show some response. But three months later, you can see there is progression of these lesions. And this was one of my last points when I showed the algorithm that in case you find the disease is not responding the way it should be, just think that whatever diagnosis of non-infective variety you have made could be wrong and you might have missed out on an infection. So when three months later we realized the patient was not responding, we repeated the test and they did show that there was active inflammation ongoing. Uh, even in the periphery, we could see there was a choroidal involvement and this was more of a focal over the patches. So her tests were TB were positive. CT chest showed multiple calcific lesions in both upper lobes of the lung. Uh, Montius was 18 by 18, Quantiferon was positive. We even did the whole body PET scan, which showed subcentrimetric mediastinal lymph nodes. And uh, we were not really sure because the phenotype really did not fit with TB. So the question here was, was the ocular disease due to tuberculosis or these tests are positive because we have given her corticosteroids and immunosuppression. So in consultation with the patient, we did the enucleation of the opposite blind eye and histopathology showed that there was granulomatous inflammation in this eye and we could find this acid fast bacillus sitting there, which was positive on PCR as well, meaning that what we were diagnosing as sympathetic ophthalmia was actually TB multifocal choroiditis. And this is how the patient <coughs> is res <coughs> sorry, responding to anti-TB therapy. So to sum it all up, when you look at the choroiditis, first look at the phenotype. Is it diffuse? Is it multifocal? If it is diffuse, is it retinochoroiditis or chorioretinitis? If it is mainly retinochoroiditis, for example, I showed you the first patient with diffuse toxoplasma. So if it is retinochoroiditis and diffuse, there are two possibilities. Either it could be toxoplasma, which invariably always have the involvement of underlying choroid, or it could be viral. Viral does not have involvement of choroid, and you can easily look at this on OCT. The other is serpiginous variety of choroiditis, which is predominantly choroiditis with some changes in the overlying outer retina. Serpiginous can be autoimmune variety, which is uh, serpiginous choroiditis, or it can be serpiginous like, which can be infective. So I have already highlighted these differences. So if you think it is autoimmune variety and there is no evidence, treat it as, as autoimmune, no need to investigate it too much. But if your patient is not responding the way patients should be, just hold back and investigate thoroughly. But if it has the features which are suggestive of possible infective etiology, always investigate to rule out infectious etiology.
Now, when we come to multifocal variety, you can have a very classic phenotype like tech, mutes, and the, which are non-infective and you don't have to investigate them. You investigate only if you find the patient is not responding or something is not right. And anytime you see atypical phenotype, please always investigate to rule out infections. So this is the conclusion of my talk. And I hope I'm able to convey my point of how to differentiate between the infective and non-infective variety of choroiditis and how to have a very strong suspicion of choroiditis being infected. Again, once again, I would like to thank SOE for the kind opportunity to allow me to speak to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vishali. Uh, it's a very challenging uh, area when we think about all the possible problems that we are you know, looking in seeing the patient for the first time and, and making the differentiations of what it could be if it's choroidal retino and uh, the different phenotypes that you talked about. I think your presentation was very um, clear in terms of your thinking process, which is really very helpful in, in making the decisions uh, of which way you go. And, and as you showed, the wrong decisions can lead to disastrous outcomes. Um, um, thank you for that, Vishali, and we'll, we'll see what the questions will be at the end. Um, I'd like to invite our next speaker, uh, Francesco Picchi. Uh, Francesco uh, has been working in the UAE for some years now and has been incredibly productive. A, a lot of stuff coming out of his work in publications with a group that he's been uh, collaborating with. Uh, really, really good material, good work. And uh, he's going to talk to us about the inflammation, which involves primarily the choro capillary. So thank you again, Francesco, for accepting the invitation. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to talk today about the inflammation involving primarily the choro capillary. These are my financial disclosure, but they're not relevant to the presentation. Now, when we talk about choro capillaritis, of course, we talk about an inflammation of this particular layer, the choro capillaris, which is between the broken membrane and the choroid. This term choricapillaritis comes from uh, an original classification done a few years ago that divides uh, this particular inflammation between inflammation involving the choricapillary and those involving the choroidal per se, which can be then divided into primary and secondary. This inflammation was, uh, uh, this uh, division was done by Herbert through uh, the use of ICG. ICG is a molecule that allows visualization of the choricapillaris and the choroid very well, very well. It's very difficult on ICG to distinguish uh, uh, inflammation of the choricapillaris between uh, those of the uh, choroidal lac stroma. So uh, to ICG, we have just added between the years the use of OCT. Now on OCT, you can see on column B that the inflammation of the chorocapillaris can actually be detected and it appears as a thickening of the layer with the loss of the dotted pattern. Now uh, to this, we added the use of OCTA. Now all these diseases of the choroid and chorocapillaris, I think of it as the Bruce Banner disease. Bruce Banner is a scientist, but has a second personality in itself, which is the one of the Hulk. So um, OCTA is now able to combine the use of OCT uh, to that of uh, uh, motion detecton, and it can give us a visualization of the chorocapillaris layer, um, which is now reflecting that of ICG. Before we move to the actual uh, uh, discussion of primary chorocapillaropathies, um, why primary? Uh, when we are in the second column, there's a division between primary and secondary. Um, but what's happening to secondary choricapillaropathies? Well, they actually do exist. They are secondary because they are secondary to an uh, infectious agent. Secondary choricapillaritis have been uh, recently described, uh, and uh, they are uh, secondary, for example, to syphilis. Uh, syphilis uh, in the placoid form presents with a white plaque on fundus uh, uh, picture, and uh, this plaque corresponds to RP nodularities on uh, OCT. You can see the RP nodularities in the AMFAS OCT as well. Well, the use of uh, OCTA has shown that these do actually correspond to areas of flow void at the level of the choricapillaris that can be the 
detected both in NFAS and on the B scan with the superimposed flow. And these actually do resolve very well with treatment, with the penicillin treatment. We lose the nodularities on NFAS and uh, the corticapillaris flow void, they, uh, they decrease uh, on uh, OCTA. A second secondary corticapillaritis is the one secondary to TB. Uh, Serpiginous like choroiditis is uh, a disease affecting the corticapillaris, as we can see on ICGA here. And there is a perfect correspondence on OCTA that shows the flow void at the level of the corticapillary. And these disappear with the proper treatment as well. Now let's move on to the primary corticapillaritis. According to the regional classification, these are the entities that um, compose these, uh, uh, these uh, corticapillaritis. Now let's start with mules. This is a patient uh, who has uh, no cells in the front and in the back, but a decrease in the vision. And this is due to this uh, foveal granularity that we all know now corresponds to a disease called mules. It's multiple epanescence white dot syndrome. Mutes has been considered a corticapillaritis because on ICG, it actually appears as hypofluorescent uh, lesions. All these white dots, they're hypofluorescent. And on OCT, they correspond to some RP alteration with the attenuation of the above the photoreceptors. Now, this uh, RP alteration, they can be detected on uh, uh, autofluorescent and they're hyper because there's an increase in the transmission uh, because the photoreceptors are also misaligned. But there's no reflection of these white dots on OCTA. So um, the multimodal imaging of mutes has allowed us to show that uh, these ICGA hypolesion, uh, they actually have zero correspondence on the OCTA of the corocapillaris. So there's no alteration of the flow of the corocapillaris, but they do correspond very, very well to the unfast of this OCT of the RPE, um, which means that these alterations uh, are actually at the level of the RPE. And here is another example. You can see on your right side of the screen, there's hypo uh, lesions on ICG, but there's zero alteration of flow at the level of the corocapillaris. So it's not just at the center of the macula, but also along the uh, major blood vessels. So why are we seeing those hypo ICG uh, lesions? Because normally the RP absorbs some part of the ICG that we inject, and there's a physiological back ground hyperfluorescence. If the uh, RP is altered, like it happened in mutes, then there's no uptake of the ICG, and these are um, uh, transformed into hypofluorescent lesions. Uh, this is the perfect example. In normal patients, ICG molecules arrived in choroid and corocapillaris and stains a bit the RP as well. In mutes, the RP is altered. So these particular layers where the uh, RP is altered, they don't uh, catch the uh, ICG molecule and thus they appear as hypo. So let's get rid of mutes and move on to the first primary corticapillaritis, which is MP. Now, this is a 21-year-old male that sees pots in front of his eye. ICG showed that there is uh, ischemia of uh, probably the corticapillaris or maybe the cora. It's difficult to tell, but then with OCT, we see that there's loss of the dotted part and of the corticapillaris. So we know it's a corticapillaritis. Uh, and uh, this is a case of MP. And uh, these particular lesions correspond very well uh, to loss of uh, vascularity on OCTA at the level of the corticapillaris. So uh, AMP is a placoid lesion, but um, there was a lot of discussion when AMP was described uh, regarding the etiopathogenesis. Gas, who first described it, said that it was impossible to understand if the disease were coming from the core, the pigment epithelium, or both. Um, and these are the, his initial uh, drawings. Now, Deutmann uh, described it as exudative choroiditis, and still today there's some ongoing uh, discussion, which OCTA now is able to uh, get rid of. Uh, now we know that AMP is caused by, is presents as placoid lesion of the fundus. And on OCTA, there are particular features that we have to look at. First of all, the ischemia of the corticapillaris. Second, there is alteration of the RPE and this particular uh, edema of the outer nuclear layer. Uh, AMP has a characteristic features on the fluorescein angiography. It blocks early and it stains late. It's very important to know this because it differentiates between AMP and multifocal choroiditis. Now, uh, the uh, corticapillaris ischemia that we see on ICGA correspond perfectly to uh, the loss of flow on OCTA at the level of the corticapillaris. So this has uh, prompted the uh, different groups to uh, study and uh, make a correspondence between the ICGA and the OCTA funding in uh, AMP. For example, uh, we uh, collect 
collected uh, cases of uh, placoid lesions and we compare the ICG uh, to the OCTA. And you can see that the ICG hypofluorescent lesion of AMPI correspond perfectly to the um, OCTA loss of flow at the level of the corocapillaris. And this resolved very, very well with the treatment. See on your uh, left side of the screen, the flow void at baseline, they disappear completely two months. And on the center part, the RP alteration that are above those area of ischemia of the corocapillaris, they disappear at two months. Now, multiple group have studied AMP and OCTA. And so we are now able to say that um, uh, all these uh, corocapillary hyperperfusion and RP atrophy there, we, uh, they are um, a small part of the same process. So it, whether it starts in the corocapillaries of the RP, it doesn't really matter because it's all uh, an ongoing process. Now, the second the primary corocapillaritis is multifocal choroiditis, which encompasses also the specter of punctate inner choroidopathy. Now, multifocal choroiditis, uh, we are all familiar with its, uh, its appearance. We have lesion of different age and different stage, and they mostly are hyper on autofluorescence, but sometimes you can see hypo where um, there's already an alteration of the RPE. Classical uh, appearance on OCTA is the inflammatory material that's hyperreflecting and it breaks through the RPE into the outer. Uh, uh, multifocal primary corocapillaritis and the ICG proves it because we have the ischemia of the corocapillaris, but it's the corocapillaritis where ICG is the least useful. Let's look at other OCT features that we can study. Of course, in this case, we have the same material breaking through the RP, which is ruptured, and this particular um, cone of hypertransmission, which probably comes from the uh, ischemia of the corocapillaris. And it's present also when the RP is still intact and the material hasn't broken through the RP yet. Why am I saying that ICG is least useful in, uh, in uh, multifocal choroiditis? Because in multifocal choroiditis, it's paramount to distinguish between the inflammatory material and the uh, inflammatory choroidal nevascularization then can affect it. Let's look at this particular patient. You can see on FA um, in the yellow circles, probably these are uh, inflammatory choroidal nevascularization, but it's difficult to distinguish between these and the staining that you get from the inflammatory material. OCTA can help, but only if we layer it correctly. You see here, there's a, a lot of confusion, a lot of flow here ongoing, but we have this particular conical lesion, which have no flow inside. You see no red inside these lesions. These are just Jackson artifact, then it's actually inflammatory material. The real um, inflammatory corridor vascularization is inside the yellow circle and you see the, the flow inside it. And you see how it improves with the treatment and uh, uh, the inflammatory material goes away completely and also the ICMV decreases. Now let's move on to serpiginous choroiditis. Serpiginous choroiditis, FA is not really useful because there's a lot of blockage from the RP. So ICG early and late, it's paramount and it shows ischemia of the corocapillaris. And this is reflected very, very well on OCTA of the corocapillaris. But you can see here, we have two particular appearance. One which is characterized by a complete flow void and one where you can see the uh, below choroidal vessels. Now, um, we can, uh, through OCTA, we can distinguish a stage, different stages of uh, a lesion of serpiginous choroiditis. So you see, when there's a complete flow void of the corocapillaris, mean that the lesion is actually active um, and there's active ischemia. Once the lesion uh, uh, heals and the corocapillaris becomes atrophic, then there is uh, a transmission effect and we have this particular appearance on OCTA of the corocapillaris. Again, let's look at an example. This is OCT of the corocapillaris in a patient with serpiginous choroiditis, and you can see uh, the transmission and the blood vessels inside. This is uh, corresponding to complete atrophy of the corocapillaris uh, uh, and the RP on the floor of fundus of fluorescence. And on OCTA, there is no uh, atrophy that we can see. Uh, let's look at the second lesion here. You see on OCTA, there's a complete flow void. So it means that the lesion is active and it's slightly hyper on autofluorescence because the above RP is suffering and it's reacting. And it corresponds to an error on OCT where there is actually corocapillaris still intact. And it's been proven by the Indian group um, that uh, uh, the actually lesions uh, in uh, serpiginous choroiditis that are less than 0.1 square millimeters on OCTA flow void, they tend to resolve better with minimal flow void. 
Uh, now, since we're not talking about AMN, because there is still a lot of debate whether it's primary capillaritis or it's coming from the retinal vessels, um, let's have a quick look at overlapping syndromes. But what do we mean by this? These are the placoid lesions that have an adjective next to it, like relentless. See these patients, it's progressing very, very fast. Lesions are healing and new lesions are appearing. This is a case of relentless placoid. Um, it corresponds to uh, ischemia to capillaris on the ICG and uh, it corresponds also to uh, ischemia of the corocapillaris on OCTA. Again, here, like serpiginous choroiditis, we have two kinds of lesions. Lesions that show some um, vessels inside, which is uh, actually a reflection artifact, and lesions uh, who, are, who actually have still some flow inside. So lesion of different stage, because this is a relentless case. Uh, the second kind is the placoid persistent maculopathy. It's characterized by, as the name says, as a persistent of the uh, disease. And OCTA and the UNFAST, they are able to, to, to tell it. Like, look at this particular patient with bilateral presentation. You see that on OCTA of the corocapillaris, there is flow void of the corocapillaris with uh, above alteration of the RP. And even with treatment at four months follow up, there is a persistent, like the name says, flow void of the corocapillaris capillaries and a persistent RP alterations. And with this, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Francesco. Uh, a very much a tough uh, topic in terms of interpretation and uh, you highlighted some of the uh, uh, difficulties that we can encounter when uh, analyzing the images. So we'll, we'll have a chance to discuss that a bit later on. Uh, let's move on to our Final presentation, uh, Professor Mark Desmet. Uh, Mark has been uh, one of the, the really leading names in, in research in uveitis and, and has been a, a friend for many years. And uh, Mark has always uh, very uh, you know, amazing ideas about uh, disease processes and in, in management issues. And uh, we're very much uh, happy that he agreed to talk to us and I thank him for that. So, uh, Mark, thank you. And he's going to talk to us about inflammation involving the choroidal stroma. Well, thank you very much. We'll be talking now about choroidal stroma and inflammatory disease uh, uh, that can be present there. So my name is Mark Desmet. I'm an ophthalmologist based in Lausanne, Switzerland. Now, if you're confronted with this picture, for example, where we're seeing these deep lesions within the choroid, maybe some involving the retina, or this one here, it may be somewhat difficult to decide exactly what's going on. And if you look at both, there are some similarities between the two. The first is sympathetic ophthalmia. This, as you can read up there, is a form of um, um, benign uh, lymphoid hyperplasia, a form of lymphoma. And so I think it's very important to have in one's mind an approach to looking at choroidal inflammatory disease. And the easiest way is to use something that you probably know is to separate them between infectious, non-infectious and masquerade syndromes. And within the non-infectious, there are systemic causes, sarcoidosis, and there are those that are purely ocular. For example, VKH, sympathetic ophthalmia, we just mentioned, birdshot or multifocal choroiditis. It's also useful to try and classify the response. If it's antibody complexes, they cause vasculitis or vascular occlusions. T cells can give you vasculitis, but also choroiditis or retinitis. It depends on the type of antigen. If it's uh, retina based, it's going to be more in the retina. If we have a melanin based uh, antigen, it may be more choroidal as we see in VKH and sympathetic. B cells can give you a more chronic disease, often leading to some fibrosis and macrophages are involved obviously in granulomatous disease, whether it's infectious such as tuberculosis or for example, in sarcoidosis. Active choroidal disease tends to give you increased thickness as there are inflammatory cells that come in there. And once the disease has run its course and you see more damage, it leads to thinning. Thinning then can be visible as disappearance of vessels in very thin areas uh, that are atrophic. The structural changes may be present in the choroid. There'll be altered vasculature, particularly in a, a scarring phase, but you can also have displacement of vessels when you have granulomas that form, particularly if these are large, as you might see, for example, with um, uh, tuberculosis. Uh, 
Also, if the choroid is involved, the neighboring structures may be affected. We may see retinal edema or macular edema, for example, or exudation, such as a subretinal fluid elevation, which is very common, for example, with VKH in its very early stages. Now, autofluorescence can help you differentiate these scarring events, the ones that have occurred in the past and the ones that are active. And this, these images here, I think, are very good for that. Above you see scars, they're sort of white, very well demarcated on the left in the color image. And they give you a, depending on the type of autofluorescence you're using, a darker image uh, on the autofluorescent image. Below you see an active lesion. That lesion is a lot uh, more indistinct in terms of its borders, and it gives you a, a whiter appearance to the uh, autofluorescence. Next to it, a bit further down to the right, uh, to the left here, we have in fact what might be a form still of an active lesion, but when we look at autofluorescence, it's now dark and black, which indicates that this is in fact a scar. What about this picture? Hopefully you've recognized this as a disease that isn't seen, does not cause much uh, the presence of many cells inside the vitreous. We see very well the retina. We see these blotchy areas that are involving the deeper structures. And so this could be, for example, birdshot. And the fluorescein won't necessarily show you very much. And on this ICG, you find that the retinal vessels are perfectly okay. But in the choroid, we're seeing areas of hypocyanescence, areas that don't really stain very much, and the vasculature of the choroid has decreased, which indicates here that we have an active disease with choroidal involvement with granulomas, but also leakage from all the vessels that are present, and we have an active choroidal vasculitis. And the presence of um, uh, granulomas inside of a, a birdshot lesion has been shown several years ago uh, in the early uh, 2010. So ICG is in fact very useful. We talk about, about a lot about OCTA as being a useful approach, but really the best one for choroid is looking at either the uh, enhanced depth imaging, and we'll come back to that, but ICG is, uh, is crucial. It allows you to identify a number of active lesions as being areas that form sort of granulomas that are hypocyanescent. Um, and the larger ones tend to persist into the late phase, like, but smaller ones tend to sort of disappear and fade out as you go through the ICG phase. And you should look at images that go out at about 30 minutes. Scars tend to remain constant in their appearance and they don't really color later on. And, but while ICG is good to determine the presence of activity, it's not all that good to monitor. And you can see this in the central images. On the uh, right, you can see, on the left, you can see how the image is changing in this choroidal granuloma. It's decreasing in size, posterior anteriorly, as you can see on the right. And in the middle, the reason why there is a little difference is that, in fact, most of the change is not along the periphery of the lesion, but really the very center of it, where it comes in contact with the choriocapillaris and the RPE. Now, an important thing to realize is that granulomas inside the choroid disappear posterior anteriorly, while the ones that are present inside the retina, and in particular the choriocapillaris, tend to disappear anterior posteriorly. And this is often what is being mentioned as the means by which uh, granulomas disappear inside the retina, but it is somewhat different in this specific, uh, if we're talking about the choroid. Let's talk about some etiologies, and I know we've talked already about infections, but let me mention Mycobacterium chimera in passing. This was used to be called Avium intracellulare, very similar to TB. It gives you these tiny little lesions, not very large choro choroidal lesions. Um, it can involve the retina, but often causes a vasculitis, and it's associated with uh, major organ transplantation. So combinations of uh, lung, heart, or lung, liver transplants, you may end up seeing this, and it has to do with contamination of the equipment used to maintain these patients alive uh, just after their transplant. You are all aware of BCG immunotherapy for bladder CA, and commonly you'll see granulomas form uh, inside the anterior chamber, but there is a report of these very deep lesions as seen here in, this, uh, in B at the level of the choroid. So BCG immunization can give you a granulomatous disease of the choroid.
Syphilis very, very rarely will give you a granuloma. It's usually associated with changes that are more anterior at the level of the pigment uh, epithelium and uh, the retina. But they have been described, and, uh, and you can see one of these uh, images here. It responds very nicely to penicillin. More commonly, we talk usually of the posterior placoid chorioretinitis. This does not cause really a choroiditis. It causes an inflammation of the choriocapillary, and that's what you find on the uh, uh, OCT. Moving over now to masquerade syndromes, I mentioned earlier unilateral lymphoid hyperplasia. We know that this is a, a marginal B-cell lymphoma of very low grade. You see the pathologic image on the left. It causes discoloration, as can be seen in the uh, left-hand image of the fundus. Thickening that can be present within the uh, choroid or sometimes also at the outside of the sclera. It tends to progress very slowly, doesn't necessarily require treatment initially, and responds very well to uh, radiotherapy, and usually present in men over 50 years of age. Now, sarcoid granulomas can form because of chemotherapy, for example, checkpoint inhibitors, but also the BRAV and MEC uh, modifiers, immunomodifiers. It's very uh, commonly is associated with either prembazizumab or nivolumab, PD-1 or PD-L2 uh, inhibitors, and so it's important to be aware of that. But maybe you should also be aware of the fact that in cancers, you can have an associated sarcoid granuloma. And it is mainly associated with leukemias and lymphomas, but it has been described with other forms of adenocarcinomas, either from the breast or from the uh, lung in particular. What about systemic? Well, you'll recognize sarcoidosis in this case, and very often it can involve the retina, uh, leading to the, uh, these typical candle wax drippings. But this case here involves mainly the choroid. And you can see again that the ICG is a very good way to be able to define where the involvement of the choroid is present, the granulomas seen on enhanced depth imaging. And the reason in part I show this one is because you'll see the indentation of the retina I spoke to earlier. And over time, over six months time, below is the initial image, above is a follow-up image taken at the same location, and you can see that the granuloma is progressively uh, disappearing. It's not quite gone, but it has uh, significantly decreased. And another granuloma here is again nearly completely gone several months later. VKH is probably the prototypical disease that involves the, uh, the choroid. Initially, it'll give you, of course, the headache, these pinpoint lesions on the fluorescein, as seen here on the left. And what you'll see very quickly is choroidal thickening. And in this case, treatment very aggressively with very high dose steroids, and I mean up to 2 milligrams per kilogram, is important if you want to stop the disease. Starting with a lower dose of steroids is fine. The uh, serous detachment will disappear, but you'll have to associate it very quickly with the non-steroidal if you want to get improvement, mycophenolate or another, if you want to be able to get rid of this disease completely. Otherwise, you can of course use biologic agents and Humira works very well, but with Humira beware, you need a prolonged treatment. This patient did very well. The original um, uh, uh, a disease disappeared. We had a subretinal uh, inflammation, as you can see here. Um, but then when she stopped about a year later, it recurred as it was present uh, initially. And this is rather different than what we saw previously because overt recurrence in the posterior pole was very uncommon. This is an old slide I had from about 15 years ago. While recurrences, if you get chronicity, tends to involve the anterior segment, causing you these iris nodules, as well as a granulomatous disease. So here's this patient. We can see that we have an initial thickened choroid. It decreases with treatment. She stops her treatment, and uh, shortly after, it becomes, again, uh, increased thickness in the choroid. And she starts to develop these little types of uh, folds inside the retina. And within a few days, five days, she gets a recurrent detachment. We've responded very well to Umira. She stayed on another two years on Umira and then was able to wean off. Chronicity in VKH leads to shallow anterior chamber, increased pressure, acute glaucoma, and of course the most important uh, manifestation is depigmentation, the sunset glow appearance inside the retina, which leads in fact to a severe problem with glare, and it is often the reason why these patients are virtually blind at the end of their life. So in VKH, it's very important, be extremely aggressive in the beginning, 
And if you start seeing the pigmentation that starts usually peripherally, you need to increase the amount of immunosuppression you give, because otherwise, when these patients read about 60, 70 years of age, they'll be essentially blind. Other disease, very similar, again directed against a pigment, the melanin, a tyrosinase protein. This is sympathetic ophthalmia. And here also, if you can recognize these depigmentations early on in the process, you'll be able to stop this pathology in its uh, infancy before it reaches this stage, at which, in fact, even with high-dose uh, non-steroidals, uh, cyclosporin, the use of um, FK506 or, or serolimus, we won't really be able to st stop the progression of the disease. I've had a patient that had ocular trauma. Within about a month, she developed some lesions in her contralateral eye that were looking typical, similar to this, active lesions. And on high-dose steroids for about two months, we stopped the process completely. And five years later, there was absolutely no evidence of sympathetic. So if you suspect sympathetic, high-dose uh, treatment, and you may get an improvement. This is multifocal choroiditis, punctate intercoroidal by PIC are two similar diseases. They affect the posterior pole. Here's a case of PIC. The previous one was more multifocal. They have these small lesions, often more in the nasal side for PIC. Both are associated with neovascularization of the macula, which will respond to anti-VEGF, but more importantly, will respond also to non-steroidal. Uh, I mean, to uh, the use of medications for the inflammation. We do see thickening of the choroid in this disease, but as you can see, the process here over the first visit up left and the lower visit after eight months, the thinning is, is not complete. And we don't see most of the time complete thinning in any of these diseases, but you can monitor response to therapy by looking at the thickness of the choroid. This is one of my cases, neovascular membrane, did not want any treatment. And so when she came, she had a massive increase in her choroid. She did respond to some intravitreal treatment to get rid of the, the neovascularization, but there was no change in the choroidal level. And again, choroidal neovascularization in this disease is what you want to recognize. Bichette's disease can also give you an increase in choroidal thickness. Um, this may be, in fact, a better way to monitor response to treatment than just the fluorescein, uh, if you're able to see the back of the eye. And you can see here the difference between the two. On the right, the choroid certainly gives you a better impression of, of the response to therapy. And with regards to birdshot, we've already talked about the importance of looking at both the, the choroidal circulation, where we saw vasculitis, Vasculitis can obviously also be present in the retina. They can be happening at the same time, but often there's a discrepancy between the two. The ICG can show you these lesions and active disease, even in the presence of less disease inside the retina. So in conclusion, choroid can be the primary or secondary target of disease. Vascular leakage, granuloma formation, and the thickening of the choroid are the things you want to look for. Consider a broad differential diagnosis because choroid is part of the systemic circulation. The inner layer of the choroid, I didn't have time to talk about that, Sattler's layers is most affected by these inflammatory processes. And um, the purely ocular diseases, as have we talked about VKH and sympathetic, required hard, strong inhibition early and for a sufficient amount of time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. And uh, I'd like to thank all the, the speakers. Um, for this really very interesting session. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Professor Gupta <coughs> will be able to join us. She had a problem and <coughs> just uh, apologizes to all of you. So I'd like to start the discussion here. We have about 20 minutes for that. So plenty of time to try to clear a few things and, and get some questions from, from the uh, audience as well. I, I think it, it's very obvious that, you know, with, with the combined use of these different technologies, we're beginning to understand better which modality is more helpful in, in monitoring disease or how we combine them in achieving the best uh, monitoring of the behavior. So it's obvious that uh, if we consider, especially the difference between the OCTA, uh, uh, which uh, Francesco spoke a lot about, uh, and, and the other uh, the techniques, more traditional um, uh, injections that we have the dyes, uh, clearly uh, there are advantages of, of the fact that this modality is non-invasive, it, it's very rapid in terms of, of the obtaining the images, 
uh, but there are limitations, of course, and, and that's that's where exactly we'd like to bring that discussion here. Uh, I think that for the UVI specialist and Francesco is leading on a paper that we are uh, with uh, Alessandro and, and Francesco leading on a paper we are about to hopefully publish, exactly analyzing this question uh, about the comparison of how OCTA would compare to ICG and enforcing, will it replace it one day, or we will look at a situation where uh, the, this old techniques still have a very strong uh, foot in what we do. So I'd like to just discuss a little bit of that uh, because there are some limitations there. Francesco, maybe you and Aniruda can, can uh, uh, chip in on this. Um, but uh, you know, we, we talked about the, 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 the fact that of course, without a dye, there's no leakage. So you cannot assess that aspect of the behavior of an inflammatory condition with the absence of leakage. But there are other things that we talked about in, in the sense of visualization of, of deeper lesions in the choroid. The chorocapillary look wonderful images, but the, cor the choroid, it depends on what's in front of it, what's happening. If you have fluid, you have other you know, obstacles in a way, you may not be able to see as well. So maybe Francesco and Annie, can you guys have a little bit of ideas for the audience? Because these are new techniques. I think people need a bit more of your expertise in, in guiding when you think it's useful. Yeah, yeah um, I'll go first, Tani, if you don't mind. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Pavese, you mentioned the lack of uh, leakage. Yes. So, if we compare, if we talk about the retina, which is not the scope here, but, um, you know, in the retina, of course, we look at leakage. So, we look at fluorescent angiography. And I think uh, you, you all uh, know Marion Monk, and she has this beautiful image of an unfast OCTA in a birth of patient that shows the thickening around the vessel that corresponds to leakage apparently I've never seen it so in in the retina I still rely a lot on FA um, when we go to the choroid uh, I started shifting a bit towards uh, OCTA uh, we've been working with Alessandro uh, on two papers on uh, granulomas and we've compared uh, cross-sectionally and prospectively the ICG and the OCTA of choroidal granulomas and we find a very very good correlation uh, so clinically, when I see a patient with uh, either sarcoid TB or BKH uh, that has a choroidal involvement, at baseline, I always get an ICG, um, but then I can also, I also get an OCTA, maybe wide field, and I, I, I follow the patient just with OCTA. Maybe every six months, I get another ICG, but that's what OCTA has given me uh, for now. It's something that I can really apply in my practice and can change something for my patients. I think it's a good point you're making about combining the, the initial assessment. So then you can use the modality just as a way of monitoring the patient. So you know exactly what it means. And then you can see how the patient is progressing. Because at the end of the day, my patients don't care if an OCTA, there is a small flow void and it corresponds to a small loss of chorocapillaris. Uh, and uh, there's another one that there's no flow void. And so the chorocapillaris is still intact. The patient doesn't care. The patient wants to see, wants to be treated. And so we need to be realistic about application of OCTA in our clinic. Very well. Any, any, anything to add? Yeah, I just uh, wanted to add one point. I think at baseline, if you have an ICG uh, and if you have OCT NGO, it it's very helpful, especially when you start tapering the steroids and at a point where you suspect that there could be a recurrence, a subclinical recurrence, uh, and OCT and geography can be very useful, in fact, to pick up small lesions, which could be a recurrence. And uh, we heard from uh, Dr. Mark Dismet's talk that VKH also, it can recur in the anterior segment. Sometimes it can recur very, in a very subtle way in the posterior segment. And you can have these granulomas and you can use OCT angio in your clinic to look if you have flow voids, dark dots. And if I suspect them, I, I will go definitely for an ICG to make sure if there is a recurrence of the disease. But I think that's a very useful point that if you suspect a recurrence or if you're at a point where you need to taper therapy or you need to change immunosuppressive agents, like for example, the patient is non-tolerant to mycophenolate, you're switching agents and the time period there is very critical and you can probably get a recurrence. That's where OCT and geography becomes very useful. Thank maybe you. I'll make a point. Maybe yes, I can make a point Mark, also, Carlos, if it's sure. okay. Um, yeah, I sure. would. I agree that if you're looking at the choriocapillaris and at the deep retina, OCTA plays a very important role. But if you're looking at the deeper structures, I'm not sure that OCTA at this stage is necessarily the best means of doing it. 
you know, one of the problems with uh, the choroid as compared to the retina is that it is a dynamic structure that, you know, with each heartbeat fills and empties. And um, also the uh, uh, RPE presents a barrier to certain OCTs, depending on which machine you use. So speed's important to be able to see things. And I wouldn't be surprised that in the future, we won't need ICG, but we still, for deeper structures, can certainly depend on it. But I agree, and this is what I tried to show also with these granulomas, once you have your ICG, you don't need to do it as frequently as long as you can image in the same location. So re-imaging the same spot, being able to target the layer that is being involved is probably the most important thing. And having machines like you have that give you the best OCTA possible at this time in space, uh, as space and time. Yeah, that, that's a good point. And there was a question from the audience here, exactly talking, if I, if I had to choose between ICG and OCTA for the, to buy the machine, which you wanted to choose. So the discussion is showing you that it's actually, you, you would need both to be able to combine and, and understand better your patient. So it's not a question that one replaces the other. Uh, they, they're mutually uh, useful and, and helpful in, in, and they help each other in, in your monitoring and treatment of your patients. The, the, the one point of discussion and, and that's, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go into the argument of choro capillaries because I agree with the assessment of mutes. I think uh, the choro capillaries looks pretty much intact when you look at your OCTA images. The point here is exactly, uh, is this the RP or the photoreceptor which is causing the trouble here? And, and where is, where is the, the problem? And uh, uh, many years ago, I wrote a paper uh, with uh, Roberto De Lomo uh, when we talked about why is the fluorescein different in mutes comparing to the other conditions. So we see early hyperfluorescence in mutes in fluorescein. Uh, in the others, you see early hypofluorescence. So that already gives you a clue that the process is not the same, that there is something different in the way these two conditions or this group of conditions are behaving. And, and one aspect to analyze is that we thought the RPE would be the reason why that was happening. And Francesco's e explanation about the why the fluorescein, why the hypofluorescence on ICG in, in conditions in which you have involvement of coral capillaries because the, the, the RPE is, is not taking up the ICG and looking dark. And the same argument used reversely for the fluorescein. I think the RPE is getting loaded with fluorescein in a different way uh, in, in, in shining in a way that is showing that early hyperfluorescence. I'm not sure if you guys agree with that assessment. Yeah, definitely. So when we, when we did the study with Seraph, um, on mutes, uh, we were looking at a lot at OCT and on FAS, and we thought it was probably a disease of the uh, photoreceptors. But then uh, uh, Storengi's group from Milan, they, they had a very nice paper on OAI about uh, uh, how it could be a disease primary of the RP. And I think I kind of uh, agree that it's probably primarily in the RPE, but at the end of the day, it doesn't really make a difference to me or my patients. Uh, I, I still think I'm very quite convinced it's not a disease in the corocapillaris or the choroid, which is probably the most important part. And uh, that's why it's called the common cold of the eye, uh, because it's quite benign in most of the cases. Yeah. No, I think it, many features are, are different in sense of how it behaves and, and how it results in, in a very different way from the others in which you end up most of the times with, with the outer retinal damage, uh, which doesn't happen in, in the recovery of mutes. And you, you mentioned very well, the disorganization of the photoreceptors in, in the areas affected is responsible for a lot of the imaging changes that we, we observe in, in, in our patients and that recovers over time. That's why we yeah, see the improvement. That could also be, that could also be you know, RPE disease. You lose your, uh, your um, tight junction. So fluid, uh, you know, fluorescein from the choroid could come into the deeper layers. And I think a, um, a disease of the RPE will, uh, will in fact allow fluid and other and proteinaceous materials to get into the uh, deeper retina. So it could be, you could still see on OCT the changes you're seeing. And if you look at active multifocal lesions, they tend to be more at the level of the choriocapillaris, and then they cause these, these bubbles that form in the deeper retina that extend into the, uh, into the uh, inner retina, inner uh, plexiform layer. And I think, you know, as the disease regresses, all of this disappears. So I think we have to also look at, you know, um, the dynamics of what can happen at that level. So I, I, I would go more for RPE. Okay, agreed. Thank you, Mark. 
There was a question from the audience here. Has serpiginous choroiditis been associated with sarcoidosis? So any, you might be able to, to answer yeah. this. If you're shy, there, there, are, there are reports that sarcoidosis has been associated with serpiginous choroiditis. If you uh, listen to Professor Narsing Rao, um, I remember in one of his lectures, he attributed three reasons for serpiginous uh, choroiditis. One is TB, viruses, and sarcoidosis. Uh, but to be honest, uh, in, our, in our clinical practice, we have not seen sarcoidosis causing co uh, serpiginous choroiditis um, as an etiological factor in our patients. We somehow don't find um, a direct uh, sort of an association. So there are reports, I don't deny that, but I have not seen any patient of sarcoid presenting with serpiginous. Uh, the usual manifestations I see are vasculitis and granulomas, apart from conjunctival involvement. So um, how about the others? Have you seen any? I haven't really seen any. No, I, I have not seen a case that I would say was a serpiginous induced by sarcoid. What we have to keep in mind, well, Mark? No, I haven't either. I think, you know, yeah. PIC and uh, multifocal is different. There I have seen that, uh, uh, you know, progression, but never in, uh, in serpiginous. Yeah, I think the one thing to remember is, is sarcoid is in a way, a, a can be, of course, I think sarcoid is a syndrome rather than a disease, mm -hmm. and, and it can be a spin of TB. So you, you may very well find the TB evolving into a sarcoid behavior, depending on the immune response of the host. So it, it may be that in some cases that you, you have to see those reports, Annie, but uh, it may be that this is the potential confusion there. It could be that TB was the, yeah. the core of the stuff, and then induced changes which are also compatible with sarcoid, which we see very often. So I'm just, just speculating here, but it's a possibility. There, maybe I can make one comment about serpiginous because Vishali made the point that uh, in serpiginous, it's always bilateral. And you know, the lesion she showed is a fairly large lesion, but at the very early stage, it, there can be very, a lot of AC, 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 ah, it can be asymmetric. And so sometimes you just see a little bit of a lesion in one eye and it might even be absent. And so following over time may help you to better define exactly the disease uh, pattern. So, you know. I'd just like to um, add one more point, which is uh, childhood sarcoidosis, which is uh, one of the entities, which is Blau syndrome. Mm -hmm. That can be associated with chorioretinitis patches. Uh, they're not typical serpiginous like, but that, that is definitely associated with uh, these patches of choroiditis. Mark, there's a question here which probably can go to you because you talk about more the uh, stromo. It's uh, what are pathognomonic signs of BKH? Bilateral exudative retinal detachment, optic tooth swelling, thickening of the choroid, cells of the anterior chamber. Is this sufficient to make the diagnosis? Well, the cells of the anterior chamber would be uh, are usually not present in the original uh, acute stage. In the acute stage, you'll see the uh, uh, retinal detachment a very proteinaceous subretinal fluid. You might see even uh, some uh, proteinaceous membrane under the retina. The typical uh, choroidal thickening that we showed as well as these uh, pinpoint lesions on fluorescein, the optic nerve may be involved, certainly if it's very diffuse, but it's really the retinal changes that are typical. And then as these uh, regress very quickly, uh, they can either recur, as was mentioned, and most of the time you see the anterior chamber involvement when you get chronic disease that involves the uh, iris, and the iris very often loses its scripts. You start seeing some uh, granulomas at that level. And if the iris becomes too thick, you'll start having glaucoma, but that's a much later, uh, this is more of a chronic stage. Um, Vishali presented a, a case, two cases that were very interesting. I just want to make a comment. Uh, she's not here, unfortunately, but she presented that case of the toxoplasmosis, which was confused uh, uh, with, with uh, a choroiditis initially and then treated. And, and she said the patient was, was immunocompetent. But we have to remember that patient received an IVTA and also was using oral steroids. So that individual was turned into an immune deficient individual, at least locally in the eye, with an IVTA. And, and, and that's just to highlight the, the point we always make about do not treat an infectious disease in the eye with a depot injection because the, the result is usually disastrous. So that, that's a good example of that. And this confusion can lead to the wrong decisions. If you don't really identify uh, 
the, the retinal involvement, you conclude it's only choroidal, then you may make the wrong decisions. Francesco, you had your hand up and then you put it down again. Yeah, can I ask uh, Professor Dosmet a question? So he mentioned that in Burshot, uh, ICG and FA are paramount because they choroidal and retinal involvement, they are not always, uh, uh, they don't go side by side, they're independent. Um, do you feel it's the same uh, um, in terms of treatment? So sometimes when you treat these virtual patients, you see a choroidal response, but not a retinal response. And so, and, and also, do you get FA and ICG more often in virtual patients? Um, I use it essentially to try and diagnose the uh, involvement because with birdshot, the difficulty is you don't see much inflammation. And historically, patients with birdshot within five to 10 years would become blind because we didn't treat enough. So to me, if I see involvement of the choroid or involvement of the retina, I want to get rid of that involvement. And if I can follow it with uh, choroidal thickening, if OCTA can help me or some other modality, then I'll use that, but I'll try to be as aggressive as I need to be to get rid of that disease. And we talked about multimodality in some ways with OCTA and for birdshot, for me, doing a visual field and uh, getting electrophysiology is very important, knowing if the patient has any kind of night blindness because all of these features will help me know a little bit the stage of the disease and how aggressive one has to be. But ideally, you want to be able to eliminate the disease. That's number one. So, you know, with biologics, with, you know, a combination of, uh, of uh, let's say, calcineurase inhibitors or other. And then once you reach a stage where there is no disease present, somewhere between three and six months later, I'll try to reduce the dose to the minimum dose necessary to see no change in any of the parameters. But as, as you, and I, th I think most uveitis experts, we prefer not to use uh, uh, you know, invasive imaging techniques using contrast mm -hmm. if we don't have to. So for birdshot, I try to find whatever will help me, whether it's a, a visual field, whether it's uh, electrophysiology, or just the OCT before I repeat the angiograms. I think an important point I want to make here, the time is beginning to run short now, but uh, I, I think the point that you guys have made in the course of these presentations in terms of the choroid, uh, uh, VKH, when you treat initially, patients respond with a serious attachment disappearing, vision improves, bird shot, you get rid of the vasculitis, your patient feels happy. But if, for, if you forget the choroid, the disease will have a very bad outcome. So uh, uh, we cannot be satisfied with, with the resolution of the acute problems that led to the symptoms and presenting symptoms. You have to be aware that the pathology is still happening. And if we are not taking care of the choroidal inflammation aggressively, the result will be uh, a bad outcome, as uh, if you, Mark, talk about bird shot, and we know very well about uh, VKH. And, and the issue of treatment is important because uh, they, they can respond differently, I think. The, the choroid and the retina will respond differently. The vasculitis may respond very well to local therapy, which does not really improve the, the behavior of the choroid, which then requires systemic therapy. So the strategies are combining therapy sometimes to be able to achieve a, a good balance between local and systemic reduced burden of exposure, but always keep in mind that if you don't shut down the choroidal inflammation, you, you're having trouble, not immediately, but in due course. So it's a question of, a, of a making sure that is, is clear in your mind when you treat your patients. And it's um, the one we uh, usually miss because we're not looking for it. So we have no, to do that. That's the important No, absolutely. Thing. I think it, it's all, all that we're highlighting here today is important to bring uh, uh, to people's minds the, the fact that we have several tools now that are allowing us to look into the choroid. It is no longer an, a, an accessible layer. We, we can see it. We are learning how to look into it. We're learning how these different techniques uh, can, can be used to interpret the findings and how they can be used to combine to uh, monitor uh, disease uh, progression and response to treatment. So I think this is an important message to everyone uh, about these conditions. I don't know if any of you has any final comments to make before we wrap up the, the session. Um, Francesco, uh, Ani, Mark, any, any final thoughts? Maybe one final one about the toxo is that, you know, the image that we saw with Vishali reminded me of our immunosuppressed patients with AIDS. And in the AIDS era, toxo lesions looked like viral infections, very much like CMV. So if you see this, uh, this image, think about toxo because it could be, you know, steroids is a form of immunosuppression. You'll see some patients certainly that have been immunosuppressed for other reasons.
And it is a little bit like uh, syphilis, a bit of a mimicker. It mimics other things, particularly viral infections. And I think the moment you see a retinitis, think infection, really. Don't, don't uh, uh, no, be fooled by just using immunosuppression because there's a great chance that this process is, is an infection or eventually an infiltration uh, of the retina. Um, I, I think we are pretty much uh, on, on time here to wrap up the session. I'd like to thank all of you, uh, Mark, Francesco, Aniruda, for your excellent presentations, and Professor uh, Vishali Gupta, who couldn't join us at the end, but gave us an excellent talk. And uh, uh, we hope to see everyone in, in person at the uh, 2023 uh, SOE meeting in Prague. So thanks, everyone, and uh, have a good weekend, and uh, hope to see you soon. Take care. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you for the invitation. Bye. Bye.